all for coming. Um, everyone get food and stuff. Feel free to stand up and move around and grab stuff. Um, my name is Susan Park. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Assistant Director for Research for Virginia Sea Grant. We have also in the room Janet Kren, who's our Director of Communications, and our Director, Troy Hartley. Um, as you may have uh, guessed, we're actually webcasting this live for students who aren't at VAMS, and we're recording it as well so that we can post it online for folks who couldn't make it. So um, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of words in a PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to stand right here and not move so that the folks online can see me um, and they are able to communicate with us through chat. But I don't want it to be really formal, I want it to be a discussion so please feel free if you're online to post questions in the chat box and for the folks in the room just to interrupt me. So I'm sorry if it feels like a very formal lecture. That wasn't the intent. That's kind of how, how it ended up being. But um, it's really just um, an opportunity for me to talk about Virginia Sea Grant, who we are, um, and then go through sort of like a mixed bag of stuff. It's really a lot of stuff I want to cover, um, give you some background about the kinds of funding opportunities, particularly fellowships that are run through Virginia Sea Grant. Um, specifically, I'm sure a lot of you are here to talk about the, uh, to hear about the, uh, the Graduate Research Fellowship Program, that competition that's open. But we do run a lot of other uh, national fellowships through Virginia Sea Grant, so I want to touch on those a little bit as well. And throughout the process, I'm probably going to go into a little bit more detail than is necessary, but part of uh, what I want to do here is sort of a professional development opportunity to talk about writing a proposal, how to make a successful proposal, not only for this graduate fellowship opportunity, but just going forward into your career. So I'll kind of sprinkle sort of the, the background information from my perspective as um, someone representing a funding agency. And so if we have time at the end, I'll kind of try to wrap all of that stuff up into um, some grantsmanship type of tips. So uh, for those of you who aren't that familiar with Virginia Sea Grant, uh, we're one of 34 Sea Grant programs around the country. There's uh, the one in every coastal state, um, including the Great Lakes. Uh, we're a federal state partnership with our federal partners being NOAA, but all the Sea Grant programs are based at uh, universities. So it's kind of modeled on that land grant uh, model. If you guys are familiar with that, it was sort of originally sort of You've got agricultural researchers at universities, and you have farmers who need that information. So how do you link those two through, um, you know, get that research to those farmers through cooperative extension and outreach and, and, and that sort of discussion? And we move that towards the oceans with Sea Grant, and basically how do we connect the best available science with uh, coastal communities on coastal and ocean issues? So we work um, in a wide range of issues um, related to sustainability, ecological, economic, social sustainability, and ecosystem services, anything from fisheries to um, you know, business development in the coastal communities. So the four elements that sort of uh, make up a Sea Grant program are applied research, extension, outreach, and or, uh, education, and communication. And those four um, elements, we try very hard to promote integration across those four elements. So. That's why you'll see in this fellowship application this, um, this interest in linking research with extension and outreach and communication types of activities. Um, we are um, based at VIMS, but we are a Commonwealth-wide organization. So there's six partner institutions that um, are within the Virginia Sea Grant Network. So outside of VIMS, that's ODU, UVA, Virginia Tech. VCU and George Mason University, and we work with universities throughout the state and beyond. Um, and our goal is to be a non-biased um, broker, neutral broker of science to coastal communities. So we want to know what the stakeholders in our coastal communities need scientifically, what kinds of information, and act as a two-way conduit for that information. So we do work in a variety of issues, and these are sort of the focus areas that I pulled from our strategic plan, but it shows that um, we are interested in issues related to fisheries and aquaculture and seafood, healthy coastal and ocean ecosystems, 
resilient communities and economies, so that's sort of the community development types of issues and also um, hazard resilience, climate change, sea level rise kinds of things, and coastal and ocean literacy and workforce development. And you know, things like the Graduate Research Fellowship are what part of what we consider professional development, workforce development, preparing the next generation of marine scientists and managers. And that includes things like having this kind of a seminar where um, hopefully you'll get, gather some tips um, on how to move forward in a career in terms of uh, uh, applying for these kinds of opportunities. Um, one of the reasons I bring this up is, is we do find things in a wide variety. So hopefully there are folks online too and outside they are like doing things like social science, economics, um, business kinds of related things who will be, consider applying as well. As I said, the four elements of a sea grant program, research, communication, and communication. Um, as the director of research, I sort of um, oversee our research portfolio. And moving forward, Virginia Sea Grant is really focused on uh, funding, um, putting our research funds in graduate students. So the majority of our funding is going into, research funding is going into the graduate research fellowship program. But I did want to make you aware of the, uh, the fact that we do also fund um, I guess what you think of as the more traditional Virginia Sea Grant model uh, or Sea Grant model of funding research, which is you know to your advisors, PIs, um, through a regional research RFP, and that um, we ran this th for the first time as a mid-Atlantic wide one this past year. So we are funding research that kind of spanned um, investigator teams and topical areas uh, across the mid-Atlantic, uh, and we. Uh, those are two-year awards. The new uh, project will start in uh, Jan uh, February of 2014, and the next round of that will um, start 2016 to 18. but the RFP will come out in 2015. That's just to make you aware that that's the other research funding opportunity. But again, most of our research is gonna, funding is going to focus on those graduate research fellowships, and I'll go into more detail about that. The other graduate fellowship programs that we have are the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship, the NOAA Coastal Management Fellowship, NOAA Fishery Sea Grant uh, PhD fellowships in population dynamics and marine resource economics. And those are all national fellowships, but Virginia students apply through Virginia Sea Grant. So I'll go into more detail about that. And I did want to note that every once in a while we do have additional funding opportunities. Um, we, we try very hard to bring in additional dollars um, through NOAA and other funding agencies that we can turn around and make competitively available. We, should hopefully soon, for example, have a postdoctoral opportunity in ecosystem-based fisheries management coming out. Um, so those kinds of things do exist. And if you have like little projects, like little C grant, where you just need like maybe a thousand dollars to get a project running, we have small grants as well. So that's kind of a point to say, you know, keep your eyes open. If you have an idea and you think Sea Grant might be the right funding agency, you are more than welcome to contact me and say, hey, do you have? Is this something that Sea Grant would fund? So to go into more detail about the Graduate Research Fellowship, um, that's the announcement that just went out, and that was sort of the primary focus of this, and that's, if you guys haven't seen that, that's the uh, handout here. It's on our website. Um, give you a little background about what we're trying to do with this fellowship. The idea is really to support outstanding Virginia graduate students who are doing research that's relevant to Virginia Sea Grant on coastal and marine issues. So again, um, the funding is the students are the ones that are applying. That's why this meeting is for you guys and not for your advisors. Um, and we um, are looking at, again, that wide range of things that Virginia Sea Grant is interested in. Um, but we're looking for research that is relevant to our priorities and to our strategic plan. And with a real focus on applied research, on things that our stakeholders care about, and on um, giving you guys, through this fellowship, the additional opportunity to, to develop uh, a more knowledge on science to management. And that's why we've got to focus with the fellowship on, on outreach and end user interactions, um, specifically one through having an end user mentor. So the idea here is that you're working um, not only throughout your project, but even in writing up your application um, and connecting with somebody who might use your research in the end, helping you to um, Think about how your research will be applied. So not not only you know when it's done, who's going to use it, but even in the design of your research, how would it? How could you most? Um, 
how could you do your experimental design in the way that's most effective for end users? What do your end users need? What do your stakeholders care about? What's, how can you most effectively uh, design your research? Um, and we think that having an extension or end user mentor is the best way to do that. And that is, can be thought of very broadly. Not all research necessarily lends itself to you know, very specific, say, resource <laughs> manager or something. But um, we want our applicants to think about their, the end product of their research and, and, what, um, and how they can um, get that out into the stakeholders and make sure that their research is useful and used. So an outreach plan is another significant part of that. So what are you going to do with, with your research? Um, this is an area I know that's probably not something that all students have focused on. So this is something that Virginia Sea Grant is happy to help you with. If you're like, I don't really know who would be a good mentor, feel free to contact me. Um, our extension staff, we have extension staff at um, four different universities um, working on fisheries, seafood safety, uh, aquaculture, climate change adaptation, education, K-12 literacy kinds of issues. So um, our extension agents are a great place to start for thinking about a mentor. But that, I mean, you, you guys know your research best and who might be the best mentor. Uh, your advisors would probably be great sources for ideas for mentors. Um, and for those selected fellows, we also have additional professional development opportunities to kind of extend that training. So we have training in science communication. We ask our fellows to give presentations at our symposium so you get practice with um, presentations. And we build in funding also with the application process so that you can um, attend additional professional development um, types of uh, meetings like conferences and things like that. Any questions? Quiet. So does the research have to be specifically in Virginia or just related to Virginia fisheries or what's the extent of that? So the question was, does the research have to be in Virginia? And the, the answer is that research has to be relevant to Virginia. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to review that. But as long as uh, our stakeholders consider that uh, your research relevant to Virginia, if there's applicability there that they can see, then, then it doesn't necessarily have to be in Virginia. Um, you will note, though, that our, our, the ones who are going to be reviewing it are generally going to be folks in Virginia. So you're really going to have to make that strong case if you're doing the research out of Virginia. What's I, the breadth of who you consider your stakeholders? Uh, who, so who do you consider your stakeholders? You mean for Virginia Sea Grant? For relevant? Um, so we have an external advisory committee. And you can see the listing of them on our uh, website. but. Um, and they're sort of their core, but what, what we'll use in a relevancy review is also our extension agents who are out there in the field. And um, depending on the kinds of proposals we'll get, we'll pull in other people who are working on that issue. So um, if, if, our, if it's not well represented within our um, committee, then we'll say, hey, you know, this, we've got a proposal on this topic. Is that relevant? Is that something that's useful? So um, I'd say in that sense, the stakeholders are who you identify them to be, and we'll make sure that they're reviewed by the right, right folks. I wonder if there is any restriction for international students. So anybody could apply for this grant? Uh, yeah, uh, anybody who's, uh, the eligibility is um, anybody who's uh, enrolled or accepted in a Virginia graduate um, institute in any graduate program in Virginia. Yeah, so the question is who's, uh, like, what degree programs are eligible. And the first year that we uh, ran this, we only had um, PhDs um, as eligible. This year we're running it as any graduate student, so master's or PhD. And um, while it's not likely, I can imagine that there might be students who are not even in a master's or PhD program, but other, you know, graduate professional program that would be eligible if they're doing research. So anybody who's doing research that's relevant at the graduate level is eligible. So I think we've covered eligibility. So <laughs> any Virginia graduate student. Um, and we'll see how, how that, we're excited to kind of broaden that because I think we'll hit more students who are doing a, a, a broader range of research that's relevant to, to Virginia and to the Sea Grant. So we're excited about that. Um, we'll see how many applicants we get because that means a lot more students too. Um, so the word that we're looking at is up to 40000 per year would be coming from Virginia Sea Grant. And that would um, cover, uh, in most cases, it's sort of you build your budget um, with your advisor and with your, um, 
most institutions will have you run a budget through your Office of Sponsored Programs. But um, traditionally, we expect to see tuition on there, stipend, um, quite often health insurance, and whatever, kind of whatever you need. But we also hope that there will be, and um, strongly encourage, I think is the wording in the, in the uh, announcement, that you build in that budget for uh, the things that you need as well. So we're really looking to leverage on um, whatever research that you're already doing that is going on in your lab, perhaps you have another grant, but allow you to kind of maybe build on that and expand on that. Um, for example, we've had students in the past who you know, are working at um, an LTER on the Eastern Shore, so that's a big NSF grant, but then they were able to kind of do their own research and build off of that with the additional funds that they were getting from this fellowship. So hopefully you'll be able to build in some research funds as well as travel funds to go to a conference that you're interested in, funds to attend the research, um, so the Virginia Sea Grant Symposium that happens annually, those types of things, um, other professional development opportunities that you think would be appropriate for whatever your career goals are. So the funding uh, is up to two years for a master's student, up to three years for a PhD student. Um, by all means, if you're you know, one year away from graduating, apply for one year of funding, that's, that's totally acceptable. Um, and one of the things that's um, a part of the Sea Grant model is, again, we're a federal state partnership. So while you'll be getting up to $40,000 a year from Virginia Sea Grant, we do require that there is a um, non-federal match on that. So that's up to $20,000. So if you're applying for $40,000, you'll need $20,000 a year in match. Um, we haven't seen that being too much of a challenge for the, uh, the fellows because one of the things is that we do cap our overhead at 5% for fellowships. So it's basically you know, most grants you charge up to, the universities will charge up to 50% of that grant or so, you know, whatever your rate is as overhead. Um, and for us, we're capping that at 5%. So the difference between that is a huge part of the match. And then the rest is often things like your, your advisor's time, um, in-kind support like your lab might be providing supplies, things like that. Um, let's see, tuition remission is a big one. So uh, that's something that I'm happy to give advice on, but something probably to work out with your advisor and also um, with your, again, office sponsored programs or office sponsored research type of thing. Yeah, so in that case, like an NSF grant would be federal Correct. funding and that would not count, any NSF money would not count. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so then any NSF grants or any other federal grants could, you cannot use as match. But if you had a state grant or, you know, most of your advisors are probably funded, their, their time is funded at least part by the state, those kinds of things would work. Foundation grants, if you had something like that that's non-federal, that, that would work towards match. Um, so the timeline for application, the deadline is uh, January 31. We're hoping to notify folks pretty quickly, um, hopefully in February, and then the start date for all of the grants would be June 1, 2014. So kind of trying to stay on the academic-ish year. What if you're not technically going to be a student the month of June and July? You're not enrolled as a student? I'm not here. Well, I guess I'm enrolled at another graduate program this month, just not at Evans. Um, you need to be, uh, so the eligibility is that you have to be enrolled or accepted. So if there's something that like you're accepted for a program and you know that can be a letter that says yes you're starting in the fall or something like that and you know we're, we we want to be flexible so if you don't actually start your program until um, August or September then we can start the grant in August or September that's fine but you know you have to be enrolled in a program or accepted to be enrolled by the time the grant starts. If you're bypass, if you're a master's student bypassing to your PhD, um, and that's pretty much likely to happen. I mean, I we, that's something that we probably want to sit down and talk about and see where you are in that process. But I would encourage you to do that the three year for PhD, and we can um, make sure that that's you know clear, like a letter from your advisor stating that that's the path that you're going on would be included to kind of indicate that that's that's why you're going for three years funding. And we I, we did have that case last year, and that wasn't a problem. Uh, restrictions on who can act as we don't really we don't have any restrictions. Uh, 
So from our perspective, there's no restrictions on who can be a mentor, but we would suggest, and I'll show you the evaluation criteria a, a, a lot um, in, in a future slide, um, that you think carefully about what makes the most sense and is competitive and it makes the most sense for you as a mentor. And that's something that we can talk about if you have sort of an unusual situation where your mentor, maybe you're not really sure is, a, is the right mentor, then we can talk about it. I would say, you know, um, having like somebody, uh, another faculty member as your mentor probably doesn't count as an extension or outreach or end user mentor. So you wanna make sure that you're fitting within that definition. But within that definition, you can be pretty broad. But yeah, feel free to, if you have an idea and you're not quite sure if that's where, you know, if that's a good fit, um, if you think that's gonna be competitive, then feel free to, to run that by me. So proposals this year, we, we are adopting them for accepting proposals that we call EC Grant or ESG. So all proposals for this fellowship program are gonna be submitted through this website. And I point that out now because um, I wanna make sure that you guys have enough time to like poke around in there and uh, um, feel comfortable with it before the deadline. Because you know, to be fair, we won't accept anything that's not entered into the system after uh, before the deadline. And the, the system shuts down at the deadline. So I'm strongly encouraging you to go in there and poke around and make sure you feel comfortable with the system because we've seen that, I, I don't think it's a particularly challenging one, but we have seen as we've started to adopt it and people are getting used to it that people are waiting till the last minute and, and realizing, oh, I forgot something. I don't have this that the system needs. So make sure that you. Just a very like nitpicky question. So is it due at five o'clock on the thirty first? Eleven fifty nine on the thirty first? If the system shuts down, or just yeah, it um, <laughs> it's it's five it's five p.m. Okay. And there's a clock in the upper right corner okay. that's ticking down. Um, I'm pretty sure this one is five p.m. We have another one that's like eleven fifty nine, but it'll say in the announcement. Um, no, that's a good question because yeah. Um, and so I just listed off the things that you will need to have before you submit. Um, you need two page CVs for yourself and your advisor, um, a project summary, which is basically just the title and the start and end dates of your project. The proposal narrative, it's only five pages, so that's something to really think about. That's pretty short. Consider your audience, who's going to be reviewing this, um, and, um, and think about how you want to use those five pages. Um, your budget. Um, the budgets for these generally aren't complicated because it's usually just tuition, stipend, and a couple other things. But I strongly suggest you to think about that early and build it directly into EC Grant. A lot of folks, we have an Excel spreadsheet online that you can use to kind of sketch it out, but it doesn't look exactly the same in Excel as it does online. So build it online, and when you, before you submit, there's like a, basically, you can print it out and show it to your advisor and sponsored programs from within EC Grant if you want. I mean, you can submit this thing a million times and it won't actually accept um, your proposal as final until the deadline passes. So go ahead and just submit test things if you want to. Um, an abstract, uh, Sea Grant has these, this sort of strange standard format for abstracts. It's your uh, objectives, methodology, and rationale in three paragraphs. That's maximum one page long. But it's something that we use a lot in, in terms of uh, publicly, you know, sort of summarizing proposals and things like that, and we use that in the review process, so that is something to, to keep in mind and to, to think about before you submit. Um, a career goal statement, again, a lot of this um, uh, fellowship is to think about uh, funding outstanding students who are interested in management, and, and so thinking about um, why you're applying for this and how this particular fellowship would be helpful for you is important. Again, this is that where you put in, you're gonna upload a, some sort of proof of acceptance or enrollment, so it could be some official transcripts will say, you know, enrolled in the program, or you can get a letter from your advisor, or the letter that you got when you got accepted to the program works. Transcripts, unofficial is fine. Um, I'm gonna have two letters of recommendation that can be sent directly to me. One has to come from your advisor, and a letter of commitment from the mentor. That's basically somebody saying, yes, I've talked to the student, I agree to mentor them based on the outreach plan that's in the proposal. Yep. It's, the transcripts are undergraduate and graduate, so all your transcripts, um, PA, um, 
and uh, all the details, like a lot of things are, uh, I kind of skimmed over them, but there's a lot more detail in here and in um, BC Grant. Jen. There's a question online. Could you further describe what is expected from the data management plan and the project narrative? Ah, okay. The data management plan is a new requirement in, um, from NOAA. Um, it's part of this whole sort of government accountability issue, and I think it's an important one, you probably agree as researchers, to make sure that, you know, everyone gets their data out there and publicly available if it's funded, you know, by the federal government. Um, it's not included in the five-page max, so don't worry about that. And it's basically a plan for, you know, how you're going to archive your data and make it publicly available. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about this more. It, frankly, it's a new requirement that we've only... Um, just started to implement, so it's it's a learning process for me as well, for Sea Grant. Um, I think that a lot of your advisors probably would have a good handle on this because this is a requirement, for example, that NSF has had in place a lot longer than NOAA has. Um, but we don't necessarily think it's, um, there is a lot of, say, online data archive systems that I can help you um, to investigate, things like that. It shouldn't, hopefully shouldn't be a very detailed or onerous particular part of that. But it is a new requirement that we are, all of our funded research must have a data management plan. Did that answer your question? All right, great. <laughs> does, does that mean that just our results need to be made public? No, the, it's not just your results, it's your actual da data, a plan for your data to be public. What if, what if some of our data is coming from the government and it's not public? Oh, there are exceptions for that. So if you say something like um, it's proprietary information from a business or you know national security kinds of issues, then you can say that in the data management plan. Or if it's already publicly available data that you're using, for example, then. And if you're not creating any data, then you're probably not doing research. But <laughs> then you can just state that in your data management plan. All right, anything about, else about the Graduate Research Fellowship before I move on to our other fellowship programs? And the, the biggest tip is I, I just wanted to kind of give an overview. Please feel free to come and see me and talk to me about the program. Run your ideas for mentors by, run your budget questions by me. Um, anything, I'm here to help. Susan, are you talk about the evaluation process for the second? Oh yeah, so I'm sorry, yeah, I'm not done yet. <laughs> So, so the evaluation process, and I think this is important when you're thinking about um, building a, a proposal. That's one of the tips that I'll give you is quite often you know, you're working on your um, prospectus and you're working on your research and you're kind of in the weeds. And I think it's important from a funding agent to think about your proposal from a funding agency's perspective and from the reviewer's perspective. So that's why I'm highlighting the evaluation process um, so that you'll think about that now. And one of the things is that there are five criteria that you will be that your proposals will be evaluated on. 15% of it is that relevancy review by our stakeholders. That's the questions that we had before. So our uh, external advisory committee and other relevant stakeholders will review your abstract for does this seem like it would be a relevant and useful thing for Virginia. Um, and then um, our technical review panel, so those are more like your other scientists, perhaps some extension folks, um, you know, faculty type folks will um, review all of the proposals for academic performance and potential. So that's things like your transcripts and your um, career goal statement. Um, the outreach plan and the outreach mentor, and does it seem like you've got, um, you know, a good plan in place um, for outreach and for working with your mentor. The quality and scientific merit of your proposal is 20% and your recommendation letters is 10%. And that goes into a little bit more detail um, in the uh, announcement about what we're looking for. But I point that out because, you know, your five-page plan, you know, the quality and, and merit of that is, you know, 20%. And there's a lot of weight on things like um, your um, outreach plan and your career goals and things like that. So not to, you know, give that short shrift to make sure that you're thinking about those things. Because we do very much value with Sea Grant. Um, the entire package of the student. We're looking at overall um, potential, not just the research potential. And we do hope to have about three to five fellows um, selected through this uh, announcement, and we will be running these announcements annually from now on. So you'll, you know, if you feel like maybe you're not ready this year, 
there'll be another announcement next year. So again, um, I think it's helpful to think about how the panel that is reviewing these. Um, and again, this is more of a general how Sea Grant runs panels. Might be a little bit different for a different funding agency. Might be a little bit different for these proposals, but something to think about. Um, it's the reviewers that we select are going to be based on the proposals submitted. So, you know, getting the right stakeholders, but for the technical review panel, getting the folks with the broad expertise that are able to um, comprehensively review everything that we get from fisheries to economics to climate change, things like that. Um, making sure that they don't have conflicts of interest, making sure that they're a diverse panel. That's things like geographically diverse, gender balanced, and um, seniority balanced. So, you know, junior faculty, senior faculty, things like that. So it's going to be a broad range of people, probably folks that aren't necessarily in your field. Something to consider. Reviewers are assigned um, proposals. Um, you know, not if you if we get 50 proposals and we have five panelists, they're not going to all read all 50 very much in depth. So think about that. That um, you know, your primary reviewer is probably going to be closely in your field and with in-depth knowledge of that particular field and in-depth knowledge of your proposal. And the other reviewers might have general familiarity or may really just be reading an abstract of your proposal. So the panel is going to come together and each of those primaries is going to discuss your proposal, weigh it against the other proposals, and come to a consensus on those rankings. And that technical review panel is then, based on those evaluation criteria and their rankings, going to make res recommendations on um, what they think that Virginia Sea Grant should fund. So just to give you an idea, um, so this is a fairly new thing that we've been doing. We had some sort of student-based funding in a previous round, but really the, this kind of uh, announcement, the way that it's being run now, has only been run in one round. And that was for 2012-2014. And this was, again, PhD only. And we have um, five current fellows that are uh, wrapping up shortly. And I just wanted to give you an idea of sort of the breadth of things that um, were selected, and, and in particular, you know, different outreach mentors. We had one that's doing outreach to um, children at the Virginia Aquarium. We have uh, one who's working with a Sea Grant Extension Agency, an extension agent in aquaculture. We have two that are working with two different fisheries resource managers, and we have one who's working with a, a community um, sort of outreach organization, non non governmental organization. So really think broadly, and that's just a small snippet of the kinds of mentors that we saw in the proposals. Uh, moving on to other fellowships. We have right now out, uh, one of the fellowship programs that uh, Virginia Sea Grant manages is the Coastal Management Fellowship. And you guys may have seen that announcement circulated recently. That one just came out. Uh, this is a two-year fellowship that places you in a state coastal management agency. And um, the states that host fellows varies from year to year. So the upcoming round, these are the six states um, that are hosting. That's Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Maryland, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico. Um, and also the projects that those fellows will work on changes um, every year, too. So you're probably going to want to take a look at those proposals and see if those projects will fit with you if you're interested in this, um, this fellowship program. The eligibility is basically um, if you were graduating between January 1, 2013 and July 31, 2014 in any sort of environmental related field, you are eligible for this. Um, I'm happy to talk with um, students more. I'm actually an alumnus of this program, so I, I think I have a pretty good feel for, for, um, for kind of how it runs. Although we, I, I think we've seen a shift. Um, I think the, they do take a broad uh, range of applicants that are successful every year. Um, and that range seems to be getting broader and broader. And we've seen, like, for example, a lot of students in urban planning have been very successful lately, or um, environmental resource management types of, of students. So um, it's a wide range of students that have been um, applying for this program. Applications, again, are submitted to Virginia Sea Grant um, via the EC Grant website. January 24th is the deadline. Um, the things that you need are listed there. And um, the, what happens is once all of the applications are submitted, um, all of the candidates from Virginia interview with myself and with Troy Hartley. And from that, from based on the application that you submit and the interview, we are able to send three candidates on to a national competition. 
Um, the national the national review then takes all of the candidates from all of the states and selects that down to 12 finalists who are then um, interviewed with the six states to be selected. So you have to graduate by July 31st? No, you just have to be a, a student. Now, the target is that you will have you will be done by the start date, which is August of 2014. But th there's a little wiggle room there. But you're right. We're moving into some of the discussion of mostly postgraduate type fellowships, and there are pressures on the CBR programs to make sure that so you guys finish before the fellowship mm -hmm. interrupts your ability to finish. <coughs> Yes, no, the, for, for this particular, the Coastal Management Fellowship, it is um, any postgraduate degree master's. I think we've been seeing, you know, predominantly master's students in recent years applying for this program. Is this an annual as well? The NOAA Coastal Management Fellowship is annual. All of the fellowships that I'm going to talk about now, the national ones, are annual. Contingent on available federal funding. <laughs> <laughs> knew that was coming. <laughs> yes. Um, as far as the recommendation letters go, do you have any insight on who are the best people to choose for that? That is an excellent question. Who to choose for your recommendation letters? My answer is always choose the two people who will write you the best recommendation letter. <laughs> but, no matter yeah. how many letters are behind their name. Right, but I will. I will. I, I say that, but I. Number one is almost all of them require that your major professor, your advisor, write one of those letters. So you, then you, the second wiggle room one, and this would be true for, for our fellowship as it is with um, Coastal Management with Knaus, is then you've got the second one to play with. What do you do? And I would, I would strongly suggest that for most of these, you think about your audience. I think for a Coastal Management fellow program, for a Knaus fellowship, looking at diversity, somebody who knows you from a different context than your advisor who knows you for your research and your academics is probably a good thing to consider. So if you have done maybe something like a GK12 fellowship where you're in a classroom and a teacher knows you really well, that's a different way of that somebody knows you. If you've volunteered someplace that's relevant to this and that person knows you really well and knows you from a different perspective, a lot of these, you'll look at the evaluation criteria, will value things like your communication ability and things like that, that that somebody who knows you in a different context might actually be able to write that letter better than an advisor. And even when you're asking your advisor to write the letter, you might want to share those evaluation criteria and make sure they're hitting them and not just focusing on how great you are at working your math spec or something like that, because mm -hmm. that's not necessarily going to help for a Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. <laughs> how far in your past is too far to ask for a letter of recommendation? That's a really good question. That, uh, how far is too far for a letter of recommendation? I would suggest fairly in the fairly recent past. Um, I mean, if you're a recent, just starting grad school, then maybe you're undergraduate, but I would focus on graduate. What about like your job Jobs. before graduate school? Yeah, a job before graduate school would be relevant if it's recent. And, it's rel and I think relevancy is the key. And I'm happy to, if you, have, if you are thinking, is this a good person for me to, you know, feel free to run that by me. I'll give you my honest opinion. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've, I think I've, I, I've made this suggestion and folks have used people because they thought they'd give like a broader thing, somebody who didn't really know them or couldn't write a strong, so always think, I mean, if it's two faculty members who know you well and will write a strong recommendation letter, that's fine. Any other questions about Coastal Management Fellowship? All right, the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. Um, and this is a, it's a very popular fellowship. We've done very well in Virginia. We've been sending a lot of uh, uh, folks up to uh, DC through the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. You probably know a lot of our alums. Um, this is a fellowship that sends um, postgraduates um, to DC for a one-year fellowship in either an executive branch agency or on the Hill in a legislative position. So you're either going to Congress or you might be going to NOAA, EPA, um, Department of Energy, the Navy, places like that for a year to work on marine policy issues. Um, I'll just make a note that this announcement hasn't been released yet um, as actually part of the government shutdown. There's been a delay in getting this out. It's usually out by now. I'm expecting it any day now. So I'm saying this knowing that 
theoretically, some of this can change, but usually the application process stays pretty consistent from year to year. Um, and again, I'm expecting that any day now. So if you're interested, you, know, you can email me and I'll make sure that you get it as soon as it comes out. Or you know, you'll see a math email from me, I'm sure. Again, applications are submitted via EC grant. Those are the kinds of things that you need to get the list of 2014 plans is because they want to make sure that you've actually are likely to have graduated before you start. The fellowship starts um, February 1 of 2000. If you're applying in 2014, the fellowship doesn't start until 2015. So that's something to think about if you're kind of getting there. It takes a while for this uh, process to happen. Um, so if you're eligible, if you are currently a grad student in marine or environmental field as of February 15, 2014, and I put that as a approximate because I haven't seen the announcement yet, but that's likely what it's going to be. And the deadline will likely be around that date. And again, that's something that you're going to apply to Virginia Sea Grant. We're going to interview all of the candidates, um, Troy and myself, um, and we will send six candidates from Virginia from that pool. Um, usually, um, out of all of the uh, coastal, uh, out of the at the national competition, there's usually about 100 applications total, and they get down to about 40 to 50 finalists and a national review. And all of the finalists can become fellows if they want to. There's 10 positions on the Hill and 30 to 40 in executive agencies. Uh, there's a non-postgraduate fellowship, the NIMS Sea Grant PhD Fellowship. So this is specifically for PhD students who are doing research in fisheries, um, population dynamics, and or, well, they actually changed the name this year to population and ecosystem dynamics and marine resource economics. Um, I just got this in my email like half an hour before <laughs> uh, this seminar, so this you'll be getting this announcement as well soon um, circulated. Um, it didn't look like in my brief skim that there's a huge number of changes. Uh, again, um, the big one is that they wanted to make sure that folks uh, were aware that the population and ecosystem dynamics included folks who were interested in ecosystem-related fisheries issues. But again, it's a fisheries or stock assessment type of fellowship if you're working on those issues or if you're working on marine resource economics. It's two years of support for marine resource economics or three years for population dynamics. Um, again, it's a lot like our fellowship in that they ask you to work with a uh, mentor um, that works for the uh, at a NOAA uh, Fisheries Science Center. So you're getting that sort of hands-on experience on what it means to, to, to do um, stock assessments or marine resource economics types of research at federal facility applications are submitted again to Sea Grant on January 24th. There's no interview on this one. We just send them directly out to the national office. So that one's coming up soon if you're interested. Any questions about the fellowships before I wrap this up? When you were coming down to deciding which like three to five projects are going to uh, for the graduate research fellowship, does like length that you're applying for <clears throat> have any look at the length of funding? What I could imagine happening, for example, in making the final decision is if we've got, you know, five top candidates and, and the, you know, if we, you know, can fund, the number that we can fund might d differ based on, oh, these folks are only applying for one year, so we've kind of got, we're able to, but that's not going to make a difference. And we, we, we'll, we'll fund the top candidates on the, the review panel suggestion. Just might mean that we'll be able to fund additional if they're not requesting the full amount. So if you're looking for like command, don't worry about that. Worry about what, how much funding you need. <laughs> um, for the Coastal Resources Management Fellowship um, or internship? It's a fellowship. Fellowship, yeah. Do they lean more towards um, giving people who don't have very much experience an opportunity, or do are they trying to just get the best candidate? I mean, what is the That's a great motivation question. of the people who are choosing? So for the Coastal Management Fellowship, 
what what are they looking are they looking for experience or not? And that one we have to say um, it, that's a tough question. I've sat on that panel before. It's a it's a bit of a combination. They want to, it to be a learning and educational experience, but at the same time, those projects and proposals that the the fellows are assigned to do have some specific goals. So. If you're not a good fit at all with any of those projects, that's going to be a tough sell if you really don't have any background at all. But um, the panel is very specific in saying we don't want somebody who's just applying for a job with New, New Jersey Coastal Management to do that project, to do shoreline hardening or something. If they, if they wanted that, they should just apply for that job. They are thinking of it as an educational experience. They do want folks who have a broad interest. Um, and that's, that's particularly true, I'd say, also for the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. Um, they take candidates who have a lot of policy experience, and they take candidates who have no policy experience. They want that breadth. They want it to be an educational experience. So don't think that you don't have an ex enough experience for the fellowship. It's more of a, are you a right fit for that fellowship? Any other questions about the fellowships? Okay. So I just wanted to wrap up with sort of an ending uh, wrap up of, from my perspective, some of the things that I've learned sitting on the other side of the table, um, accepting applications, watching proposal panels go through, some tips for how to be successful in writing proposals. Can I add something extra? Sure. Seagrant is pretty actively looking for additional dollars to continue to fund fellowships in different areas. So this may not be a comprehensive list of what ultimately we'll be able to fund. We, we are doing some work in collaborative fisheries research that, that has some likelihood of, of having a fellowship in the near future. Susan mentioned earlier that, that we have uh, finalized an agreement with the uh, Noah Chesapeake Bay Office for a postgraduate fellowship in ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, so but, but we're kind of putting the final touches on what that uh, announcement would look like. So uh, I see us also being able to add to that list uh, with additional opportunities as well. So for those folks online, it was Troy Hartley mentioning, just uh, reiterating that we will likely have additional fellowship opportunities out there, um, including uh, the opportunities in collaborative fisheries and ecosystem-based fisheries management. All right, so uh, grantsmanship tips. Uh, one of the things to think about before you even start writing your proposal is talk to the program officer, whoever your funding agency is, whoever that program officer is. In that case, that's going to be me for these particular fellowships. My door is open. I really enjoy speaking with students and applicants. There's a lot of little like tips and tricks that sometimes, you know, just reading the announcement, it's hard to really know what the uh, funding agency maybe is looking for. You guys have asked excellent questions. Those are the kinds of things that um, I think really help a proposal. So feel free to talk to your program officer beforehand and ask questions. I'm happy to sit down with anybody with you, with your advisors, um, as you're starting to write these proposals. Um, know your agency and their funding priorities. That's why I went through all of the Virginia Sea Grant background, so you guys really understand the kind of perspective that we have, the things that we're interested in, things that we want. You know, What's the mission of that funding agency? What type of research do they fund? Who else will be applying? Um, and so, for example, for us, we, we value applied research that's aligned with our strategic plan and with our stakeholder needs. Uh, we do fund a wide range of topics, and we do like to see you know, a wide range of topics, interdisciplinary topics, partners and teams, um, doing that integration across functional areas, across research extension, education, outreach types of things. We like to see the involvement of extension and end users. I mean, if you think about relevancy, if you've got as your mentor uh, a, a state resource manager who says, yes, I really need this information, that's going to go a long way in saying, OK, that's probably relevant to, to our state. Um, and uh, you know, we, we want to see that there's an outreach plan with our research. I've messed everything up here. What did I do? Okay, when writing your proposal, 
write a great abstract. I think a lot of folks leave that abstract to the last part. I hope you've heard me say that sometimes we use that abstract in different ways, including in the review process. Sometimes that, some reviewers, that might be the only thing that they read or the thing that they read first, and so it captures their eye. So write a great abstract. Um, provide enough detail and methods to evaluate the merit and feasibility. I think that's where a lot of folks um, uh, kind of have struggle with a five-page limit, how much detail, and quite often it's not enough or too much. So think about your audience, maybe get other folks to review it. It's got to be enough so that folks say, okay, this is a sound experimental design, this makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the weeds. Consider the fact that it might not be somebody who's directly in your field that, that's reviewing this. But it has to be enough that people say, okay, I know what they're going to do. I understand that, and that makes sense. Um, follow the rules and the deadlines. I, I, we have to be fair. So um, different funding agencies are, are different, but we're particularly strict. If, it, if you go beyond the page limit, if you turn it in late, no exceptions. So uh, it kills me when people like to just are you know ruled out for a technicality. So follow the rules and the deadlines. Um, Allow enough time to submit the thing after, through all the reviews and submissions. So again, now give your Office of Sponsored Programs enough time. Um, e these proposals do need to go through your Office of Sponsored Programs, um, even though they're like fellowship applicants. Not, not the Knauss, but the Graduate Research Fellowship need to go through. So make sure there's enough time for that. Um, make sure there's enough time for any sort of weird online submission systems glitches. Um, do a careful edit before submitting. I think a lot of, I mean, I know that's kind of a uh, no-brainer, but I think a lot of people don't do that, and it, I, reviewers do get frustrated with things that, you know, just difficulty in, in reading proposals. Susan, we have a question from online, and we, there was a question earlier about whether you could do your research out of state, and this question is, what about out-of-state mentors? If our focus is on the Chesapeake Bay, can we have a mentors from Maryland while we're doing our research in Virginia? Yes. Mentors that make sense that if you're doing research that's relevant to Virginia, actually I think one of our current mentors is out of state because they're looking at a regional question. So absolutely. Um, again, you have to make the case that the research that you're doing is relevant to Virginia. You have to make the case that you've got a solid outreach plan and mentor. But yeah, please feel free to think outside the box. Can make a comment about all the rules and deadlines? Sure. Um, you know, we've had examples where folks have submitted before we were doing the online stuff, you know, 90% of their proposal, and then they've got that last 10% that they went beyond the deadline for. And they say, oh, that's not fair to me as the submitter. But if you think about it from the funder's perspective, what we are thinking about what's fair for everyone in the pool. Is it fair for you if you submitted yours on time and someone else had an extra hour? So that's where the where the not fair part is in that equation, um, and we have plenty of war, war stories we can share too about just what led into a lot of these bullets. But yeah, I know my my uh, announcements keep getting longer and longer because I keep finding more and more ways that <laughs> people are like, oh, I didn't explicitly say that, did I? Darn, nice. I have to accept that. So yeah, so please do uh, follow the rules. Um, so consider the review up front. That's why I went into all that detail about the panel, because I think a lot of folks don't think about that when they're writing their proposal. They're thinking about maybe their advisor or their colleagues. Um, but the review panel is a very different animal. So look at those evaluation criteria, and especially if there's percentages, the rankings. So make sure you're putting the effort where the evaluation is, is, is warranted. Um, that's one of the the tips I give a lot in the Knauss Marine Policy Fellowship, um, they've got a pack. So if they don't even see the word, like one of the things is the criteria is extracurricular activities. If they don't see that word on a quick skim, you're getting zero for that. You know, so <laughs> make sure you read the evaluation criteria and you're hitting those. You know, um, consider your review audience. Quite often they're not going to be local, so don't use local terms that nobody, somebody from. Um, California is not going to understand. Um, and they're probably not in your field. Or if they're in your field, they're in a different, you know, part of your field. So the, the, you know, don't use a lot of jargon. Make sure it's clear for a, you know, really 
smart scientist who's maybe in your discipline but not in your specific field. Um, a lot of uh, funding agencies really want you to suggest reviewers. It's my job to find reviewers for all the proposals. I have a background in larval ecology, so when I get something on like you know biogeochemistry, I'm you know that's part of my job. But it's also really great when I get good suggestions. I don't use them all, but they're very helpful for me. And uh, and you're also um, welcome to uh, suggest reviewers maybe that you shouldn't include. You know sometimes there's nuances in a field like maybe there's particular um, hot topic, controversial topic where there's kind of sides. You know maybe you want to. You know, let the funder know that okay, this is a tough you know situation. You probably want to avoid this particular reviewer. And we will you know certainly not necessarily take all, but we'll take recommendations, and we appreciate those kinds of things. Where's the proper place to do that? Uh, with uh, so the proper place to do that is one, just talk to your program officer, let them know, and two, a lot of times um, they'll actually give you a place to do that in a proposal. We don't have that for this this particular um, system. Um, because the fellowships are a little bit different, because we're looking at you know broader things than just the technical expertise. We're looking at people who think about workforce development and professional development broadly. Um, but for most of our proposals, we actually have a section that says, "Please suggest reviewers." And that's not uncommon for a lot of funding. most. Yeah, most including, funding agencies will say that. Including that part about saying you can recommend folks not to ask. That's not unusual. And and we're su we're um, surprised that people don't take advantage of that as much as they could, you know, because we want to use your suggestions. If you're suggesting somebody, it's probably because that they have a lot of relevance and expertise in your field. Now, be careful with that because we are very careful, and as are all funding agencies now, about conflicts of interest. So don't ask your best friend or your advisor or your you know, close colleague or something like that. We are very careful about trying to stay outside of state because, or even the region, because folks in Virginia and Maryland work together a lot. So just to get, you know, kind of an outside perspective. But you guys know better than I do who's the expert in your field and who would give you a good review. And, and so that point about thinking about your review audience as a writer becomes really important. In the, um, the war stories we have are about PIs calling us up saying, I'm brilliant. This is a really important, critical question. You are stupid, and your reviewers are stupid too. <laughs> so just, you know, they're not thinking about the audience. And they're not thinking about the funders' um, priorities in that comment. So um, think about that, 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 who you're writing to. Yep. And um, the best thing is practice. Uh, if you guys find opportunities to get to, um, well, one, submit a lot of proposals, I think you know that's one of the things we're hoping you guys are going to gain from applying for this competition is practice in putting together a budget and submitting a proposal. Um, but if you can volunteer to review proposals, you guys can review each other's proposals. That's a start just to get a sense of how people frame things. And if you can sit in on a peer review panel, then you get a, a real sense of how those panels are run, what the dynamics are. And that gives you a totally different perspective on um, how things are reviewed. So if you can practice, please do. On that note of submitting a lot of proposals, if Say you're on the edge of being, you know, having your act together and everything for you. Like, I want to try to get in this year, but, you know, maybe it's not going to be quite as perfect as if you waited a year sort of thing. Would, would that reflect badly on you that, you know, obviously you're doing your best job at it each time, but, you know, somebody, they're like, oh, we saw this last year, you know, you didn't get it last year, uh, you know, we're obviously just going to throw this out of the bucket right away before, because obviously we didn't decide it was good enough last year. Right. So the question is, like, should you go ahead and submit and for practice even if you don't think you're really quite ready for that? I would say yes. I would say absolutely. Number one, the panels are going to vary from year to year. So it's, the person that reviews it this year is not going to be the person that reviews it last year. I'll know that you submitted twice, but the panel won't, and we take the panel's recommendations. Number two, the reviewers this year the, the, will give comments back. Most funding agencies will give comments back. Um, so you're going to learn a lot from what the reviewer said, and you're going to um, be able to improve on your proposal. And one thing that we will see is if you did take those reviewer comments seriously, and that's something that you know certainly the, that we will appreciate as a funding agency that you you took those comments and you improved your proposal. And um, a, a lot of funding agencies, including uh, the regular C grant um, proposals, have a 
pre-proposal process. So you submit a, a short pre-proposal, you get comments back, and then you can submit a full proposal. And it goes along in that situation. Uh, reviewers do know that you, you got, had a pre-proposal and that you responded to those comments. So that is something I think that's useful. I mean, you got to kind of see where you're at and yeah, what yeah, makes yeah. the most sense for you. But I do think that that's a great uh, approach. You'll get a lot of good feedback. You're not limited to um, applying to several, like just in the same year. I mean, your research might be kind of you're proposing a similar project, but like obviously, like tailored to the Canals Fellowship or you know the Graduate Fellowship. That's not a hindrance, right? If you're proposing multiple, yeah. can you propose multiple proposals to different fellowships? So yeah. can you can apply to different fellowships. Absolutely, we encourage that. We see that a lot with particularly the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship and the um, Coastal Management Fellowship have a lot of similarities, so a lot of students apply to both. There's um, similarity in the information you need for both. We do suggest and we work with students to tailor their applications for both because they are different and they, they're looking for different things. So we strongly encourage that. Another thing, if you're in fisheries, is applying for both the uh, pop, Population Dynamics Fellowship and our fellowship. There's overlap there where that where that can make a lot of sense. And that isn't discouraged. The more the merrier. Better chances, right? Any other questions? I'll just throw in my contact information. Um, wow, we're like 5 o'clock on the dot. But um, please feel free to, you know, my last point on that slide, talk to your program officer. We're happy to help. We're there to help. Um, we want to see strong proposals. so. Um, contact me. I have some cards up here if you guys you probably know exactly how to contact me, but um, feel free to shoot me an email, set up a time to, to meet. Um, any other questions? I'm here to hang out for a few minutes if you guys want to ask questions, although I know I'm standing between at least the folks in the room and happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thank you.